Uh, I'm really looking forward to today's presentation. Uh, the talk today is the extreme God mainstream, which is, uh, has a lot of relevance these days, let's say. Um, before we begin, we have co-sponsors uh, co to thank, which is the Center for German and European Studies. Um, I also want to point out, I think, that uh, Professor Joe Idris's book is available. Will be uh, at 5.15. Will be at 5.15. <laughs> yeah, I was saying it's available, but didn't see it. Um, OK, will be available, and, and Professor Joe uh, Idris will be able to sign uh, your copy. So um, uh, you know, that's something to look forward to. And then in terms of uh, upcoming events, as many of you know, Next week is the center. Uh, uh, let me go back and introduce myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Larry Rosenthal. I'm the chair of the Berkeley Center for Right Wing Studies. Uh, the center next week is having a conference, the inaugural conference on right wing studies, uh, which we are hosting here in Berkeley. The conference opens on Thursday at 4 p.m. in Sydney or on campus. It's in the uh, Bechtel Engineering Center. And there will be a keynote panel discussion on the current state of the far right in the U.S., Europe, and Latin America. That event is free, and registration is encouraged because uh, it's filling up. And if you go to our website, which is CWRS, CRWS, uh, .berkeley .edu. Uh, you can sign up. Um, and on uh, the 26th and 27th of April next week, there will be two full days of panels uh, featuring domestic and international scholars on a wide range of topics related to the right. I think we have something like 90 speakers. 18 panels, so it's, it's, um, it is an event that grew and grew and grew and grew. Um, some panel presentations are completely full, but others still have uh, space, so you can find that out on the website if you want to sign up. Um, so I encourage you to look for that. Uh, cell phones, please turn them off. And finally, um, this is the way the event will work. Professor Nilla Idris will speak for around 45 minutes, and that will be followed by questions and answers. Um, and now, it's really a pleasure to introduce Cynthia Nilla Idris. Um, she is professor of education and sociology at American University. Um, she's also a senior fellow and director of outreach at the UK-based Center for Analysis of the Radical Right. Um, her PhD is in sociology from the University of Michigan. Recent books include Seeing the World, How U.S. Universities Produce Knowledge About the World, and The Extreme God Mainstream. Commercialization of the Far Right Youth Culture in Germany, which is today's talk. Um, she also writes frequently for mainstream audiences, and her work has been in uh, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Le Monde, The Guardian, and CNN Style. And with that, please join me in welcoming Professor Cynthia Miller-Ingers. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Larry and Christine, for having me. Um, I'm, I couldn't be happier to be here. I've uh, been giving a lot of talks on the book, and I'm very, very happy to be here at Berkeley, where I know there's a strong tradition of working on far right. Um, all of the center's work for a long time, and I'm sorry that I can't be here scheduling, uh, not permitting uh, for the conference in a couple of weeks. So glad to have a sort of early chance to raise some of the issues. Um, Two caveats before I begin. One, 
This is a largely image-based project, and there are a lot of offensive images, so I'd like to say that right up front. Um, I think uh, I talk at length in the preface about why I think it's important to study that which offends um, and the dilemmas that I face doing that. Um, uh, and uh, happy to talk about that in question and answer. And the second is that I'm uh, an outsider in Germany. I mean, I was a German studies major. Um, as an undergrad, I spent about a quarter of my adult life living there um, through my 30s, 20s and 30s, uh, and did, had, had a prior book in, from Germany um, and worked extensively with colleagues and experts there. But I think it's also important to acknowledge that um, I lean very heavily on my German colleagues and experts and friends to help me out with a lot of the decoding and happy to talk about that process as well. Okay, so uh, what I will tell you about is um, a roadmap for the next 40 minutes or so. Uh, first of all, how the archive visit that I originally uh, went on in 2009 turned into a quest, a nine-year quest before this book was completed. Um, I'll review the data and methods and explain the commercialization and coded symbols just so that everybody's kind of on the same page. And then I'm going to take you through one example, which is a chapter in the book on sacred origin myths, um, particularly the Nordic myths in the, in the case of European far-right extremism. And I'll close with a few implications on uh, school and educational policy, because I was studying two schools, um, and some broader implications for youth radicalization and, and theories around symbols and identity. So I stumbled on this project when I was in Berlin in 2009 for a conference, and the editor for my first book uh, asked me to see if I could find a photo for the cover. The book was about to come out. They didn't know what to do. They put the art department in touch with me and said, you know, could you, while you're over there, see what you can do about an image for the cover? And so I went to an anti-fascist archive that I had worked with for a long time while I had been doing the work for that book. And they put me in touch with three photographers, professional photographers who track the far right in public settings throughout Germany, um, at marches, at um, commemorative events, concerts, all public events. That's important because of the uh, German legal issues around photos. Um, but these were across the country over 10 years of images, thousands and thousands and thousands. And they all gave me access to their archives to look for a cover photo. Um, for the book, which they would be paid for. And while I was looking through those images, you know, I had been working in vocational schools um, where the far right was a challenge for teachers, and I was quite familiar all the way up until about 2004 um, when I had left Germany for a five-year period with this set of kind of aesthetic representations of the racist skinhead, which you're probably familiar with, the shaved head, the tall black uh, plain <coughs> people, the combat boots, the bomber jackets. I then left Germany for five years, uh, was trying to make tenure, had two babies, right? It was just a busy time. I didn't make it back to the country, the longest I had ever been away from it in, in my adult life. And while I was away, as I started to realize, looking through the photographer's images, the aesthetics of the scene had radically changed. So that was extraordinarily obvious to me, having been absent for a few years from a place where I had spent so much time, that all of a sudden, there were brands coming on the scene, one brand in particular you'll see here, um, that kind of struck my interest, that were using brighter colors, a different kind of aesthetic appeal, iconography, using symbols, um, and it was showing up all over the place. So I, you know, I went back home from that trip, um, that archive trip, just sort of stunned, right? I, I couldn't get, let it go, actually, for a while. I started looking into finding that there were other brands, um, understanding how some of the brands were using coding. Uh, for example, this uh, t-shirt that says Reconquista, Spirit of 1492, in reference to a Spanish pogrom against Muslims in the Middle Ages, sometimes not using coded language at all, um, but putting phrases in English, for example. Um, and that there were a range, I discovered, of a uh, range within the aesthetics, the, the fragmentation of the aesthetics, rather, um, of kind of some that were a bit preppier, some that were more alternative, different kinds of models, tattoos, piercings, uh, and also a use of contemporary political messaging in some of the clothing. Um, so here you see this t-shirt that uh, says, send them back, um, Fortress Europe, illegals go home, it says on the back. 
the, one of the things I want to point out about this is that it's a 30 euro t-shirt, right? So this is not cheap. It's, it's about 30, 35 dollars depending on the exchange rate. It's very high quality clothing. Um, comparable here, I would say, to something like an Abercrombie & Fitch or a J. Crew. Very well made, nicely stitched. Um, often kind of that, you know, the equivalent of instead of a screen printed t-shirt that you would have that might say Berkeley, that stitched, embroidered kind of t-shirt, those heavy, well-made cotton. They sit well, they look nice, and they are not cheap. Um, so I literally went back home and woke up kind of blinking in the night thinking about this. It was a terrible time for me to begin or consider beginning a new international project. I was in the middle of data analysis for uh, a large-scale national project on universities for the Social Science Research Council, which is this other book that Larry mentioned that just came out. Um, that was I was the lead PI on that. I was supposed to be responsible for it. I had, as I said, already two babies in diapers. It was just not a good time for me personally or professionally to do it. And so hands down, this was the most affirming experience I've had as an academic because I just couldn't let it go. And when I say it was a quest, I mean, I literally couldn't, I, mean, I took my, my kids learned German, we moved there. Um, it was, it was uh, I went to school there for a year. I mean, my whole family had to just fall in line and, and, and follow my obsession with this project, um, which started with the, with the with the photographer. So initially I thought, okay, let me do it. I can do an image project, right? That's not going to take me overseas. My family can tolerate that. I will, these photographers were phenomenal, gave me full access to their archives. I took a whole sabbatical year and built um, an archive of 3,000 or so images. And I say or so because it just never really ended. Uh, sourced from those photographers, but also from archives in Germany and the US to trace some of the symbol usage backwards. And then screenshots of all the major brands and also at that same anti-fascist archive in Germany, they had all the original product catalogs from the times of their origins before they went uh, fully online. And so I digitized all of those backwards. So um, that wasn't enough to well, you know, to staunch the obsession. So I did get funding from the Spencer Foundation to do a multi-site comparative research project in two schools in Berlin, um, both for construction trades Partly why that was so fascinating was because by chance, there are only two construction trade schools in all of Berlin. One of them, by chance, bans all ideological symbols, logos, and brands. In fact, the young people have to sign um, a, a code of conduct when they come into the school that says they won't wear these, and it has images even of the brands and the logos. The other doesn't, and the other doesn't because they believe it's undemocratic to do so. So there was this kind of, and they don't choose which school they go to. So you get this kind of quasi-experimental design. Um, and I was interested in understanding what the impact of that ban would be. Um, Oversampled occupations with far, uh, high far right engagement, which I knew from my previous research that the scaffold builders and the concrete layers um, had very high or higher um, rates of far right engagement among the youth. And so by going into those classrooms to ask for volunteers for interviews, I was more likely to get young people who were a part of or familiar with or engaged with the far right. Um, and so ultimately did 51 interviews with young people, 11 with their teachers and principals. Those 11 interviews I just used um, as illustrative or sort of descriptive data about how teachers are responding because there weren't enough. But the 51 interviews ended up being really informative. Um, and I should say they're aged 16 to 39, which is a huge span. Um, but two were um, older interviews at 39 and 34 who were returnees to a new field of training after having gone through some sort of hard periods of time in their life. Um, so without those two in there, the average age is 19. They were mostly 16, 17, 18, 19, um, 20. Uh, but those two were really fascinating in and of themselves because they talked about the far right scene in the 80s and 90s as well, and that told me a lot about how things had changed. Um, I will um, talk about this in question and answer if anyone wants to know about the analysis, but I use image, uh, the Atlas TI, which is a software program to, to, image, uh, to do the image analysis and all of the interview transcriptions as well. Um, so very briefly, I just want to say something about um, symbols. As I started working on this project, uh, one of the things that interested me in it and was, was that theoretically most scholars had tended to position symbols themselves as, as kind of support roles for social movements, as not having autonomous power on their own. Um, and it also seems, within the sociological literature anyway, to have positioned economic objects as more reflective and derivative of other social processes, like 
issues of social inequality, seeing material objects as the end product of an unequal uh, production system, rather than as having some kind of constitutive power in and of themselves. So that's going to make more sense after I go through uh, what I have to argue. But part of what I wondered is, could these clothing, could these objects have power on themselves? Might there be a role in the radicalization process or pathway for aesthetic, um, uh, on the aesthetic side, much as we know there is for, on, the, on the music side, for example? Is it possible that they're not just support, um, kind of supportive goals? In work on extremism, most work on the far right up until that point had worked on formal organized social movements and political parties. There's some work on, on, on political uh, and uh, cultural spaces, mostly um, from Pete Simi and Kathy Lee and Mabel Berzin, um, but uh, not anyone who had looked at the clothing itself. Um, and so the argument that I wondered about and eventually came to um, posit in the book is that the far right uh, perhaps is driven not only by structural and ideological factors, but also emotional and cultural ones. And uh, this project became a way of trying to uh, of trying to show how that happens to clothing. Okay, so obviously, um, as many of you may know, there was some early commercialization uh, under the Nazis in particular in Germany. You had mostly what they called Nazi kitsch, um, tourist kind of items with swastikas and busts of Hitler, and you'll see this kind of thing talked about. There was also commercialization in the 80s and 90s. Um, and you still see this uh, today in the form of kind of screen printed, homemade t-shirts made in someone's garage that are sold on a folding table at a concert or a festival, um, or maybe even in a cheap mail order catalog or on a website now. But, you know, and you'll see the kind of rudimentary um, use of symbols like the number 88 for HH for Heil Hitler, the eighth letter of the alphabet, um, 18 is for Adolf Hitler, AH, right? So you'll see uh, plan imagery and other swastikas and, and modified swastikas. But all of that changed when Torsteiner, the brand Torsteiner, came onto the market in 2002. Uh, offering it was initially a slick mail out order catalog that looked as professional as any other kind of um, mainstream high end brand. You can't see it here very well, unfortunately. It's just cut off just a little bit, but their logo here combines two band runes, um, and it, it may show up later, um, so if it does, I'll point it out. Two runes that were banned because of their association with the Nazi party. One is the Sig rune, and one is the Tear rune, I think. Can't see it. Yes, uh, and those two runes were used by the Nazis. The Sig most famously for the SS. So a number of court cases happened to see whether that um, could be banned. They were initially banned in, in all the states, I believe, in Germany. They won all of the court cases on a semiotic argument, um, which was that the combination of two banned symbols creates a new symbol, which no longer directly references the Nazi party. So those of you who study semiotics and thought there was no practical application, um, rest assured there is, and in fact more than you probably thought. Um, they quickly moved into physical store markets, um, opening stores throughout Germany, Eastern Europe. Now there are over a dozen stores in Russia alone. One opened in London. Uh, it's for sale in the US through a distributor based in Brooklyn. Uh, I think you can even get it on Amazon, though. Um, and other brands quickly followed in their footsteps, discovering that there's a market here, that there was a, a, a way to um, uh, a way to sell this clothing to young people. So by the time I was studying it, there were about a dozen brands in Germany. And as Larry saw in a shorter research presentation I gave on Monday, um, I'm now following another 11 brands that are more than that, but 11 brands across six countries um, that have opened up and uh, started in the last couple of years, including some here in the US. Um, so you'll see that there's a range, again, of, of messaging that comes here, Aryan resistance, hate core, that's HH, um, it also sounds like hate uh, for Heil Hitler. But you also have coded messages that are harder for ordinary folks on the street maybe to detect, um, like Wustenzus, which means desert fox, which is the nickname of Erwin Rommel, who commanded mm -hmm. the North African troops under the Nazis. And you have... Uh, this is a little bit small for you to see, but images like this one, again here for 76 euros, so remember this is quite extensive, a sweatshirt that says swastika on the back. Of course, for English speakers, that will be familiar to you as the, as the word swastika. It's in Latvian, 
Um, but it uh, is illegal to have that in the, uh, in the German word, which would be Hockenkreuz. Um, and so, you know, they have capitalized on a 2011 law that states that uh, Nazi signs and symbols that are now in a language other than German are no longer illegal. And that stemmed from a, you know, a case that the judges felt was requiring the police to act as detectives in a way that they weren't able to, and how are they supposed to know all these languages? So they quickly uh, developed a market for this, and they market it quite clearly. So if you speak German, you might notice that right here, where they tell you about the quality of the cotton and the zipper, and it's you know um, got a great. Uh, it says "Fleckisch absolut unbedenklich," which means perfectly legal. Right? So they are marketing that line of legality. In 2016, in <coughs> in this protest really fascinating case too of co-opting the Run DMC logo, which I can talk about how that happened. But you know, we saw this t-shirt for the first time, which was uh, the word Hakan Flights with the vowels removed, H-K-N-K-R-Z. So then the legal discussion became, is a word a word if the vowels are removed? The legal determination was it is not a word, and so it cannot be prosecuted. And so now you'll see these kinds of shirts, HTLR, right, all kinds of shirts that just have the vowels removed, and even that itself becomes almost like a meme, right, just using the signal. Um, and, but it's a way of flaunting the legality and the, the legal issues, right, too. And that's part of what I want to talk about, about why it's so attractive to young people, because it's a constant kind of game playing that enables that um, pushing the envelope. Okay, so all of that was just to get us all on the same page so that everybody understands what the commercialization is and what, what, it, what it is that I'm talking about. But the part of it that really drew me in, I will say, the, the blinking at the ceiling of the night, was trying to disentangle the ubiquity of the Nordic imagery and Nordic symbols. Um, and so I ended up writing a chapter on myths of sacred origin and trying to understand how the Nordic symbols factor into the appeal of the far right for young people. So when I talk about myths of sacred origin, I'm talking about some collection of some, uh, 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 myths that do some collection of things. So not all of these things are in all uh, countries or nations myths of sacred origin or ethnic groups uh, myths of sacred origin, but, but some overlap exists and they do something like you know, designated golden age, you often have ethnic or blood-based origins, there's a lot of mortal sacrifice or glory is dead, sacred territory, consecrated places, and sometimes magical thinking. So you'll see this in the Islamic Caliphate, for example, but you also see it in the use of the Nordic, um, the Nordic imagery that is constantly showing up in German clothing and music. The reason why it shows up, and I trace this at much greater length in the book, in that chapter, is that the, the the sacred origin narrative for the far right in German in Germany blends two sets of mythical sagas? One that there is something called Aryan racial stock, and the other is that the Germanic tribes descended from the Nordic tribes whose origins were Aryan. Together, that sacred origin narrative holds powerful sway for the far right, and it always has, or it has for a very long time. So of course, you'll see again the runic symbols like the seed rune showing up in uh, the, the, the uh, signification of symbols used um, by the Nazis, but you'll also see in, in Hitler Youth Propaganda film stills that the US Holocaust Museum has in their archives, for example, um, uh, film stills that, films that would say things like, where does our holy land lie in North Germany, the original Heimat, the original homeland of the Germanic tribes is our holy land, the Germanic tribes uh, built were the oldest sailors, they built the first ships, Vikings discovered Iceland, Greenland, and America. And I would see, I stumble across photos like this, which I found in the um, US Library of Congress uh, uh, archives where um, they have collections of photographs that were confiscated by uh, US military troops in 1945. And you stumble across things like this, which show young people or Hitler youth in Germany building Viking ships, right? This was just um, a very common kind of thing. In the clothing and the catalogs, sorry, some of those are not very clear, this comes up in lots of ways. It comes up in just the ubiquity of Nordic landscapes, of uh, glaciers and snowy 
um, kind of hillsides and, and architecture and compasses, but it also shows up in direct language. And uh, so here this brand, Eric and Sons for Viking Girls, in a constant use of iconography that displays Vikings and Viking weaponry, that uses Nordic spellings and names, the use of Nordic gods and goddesses as the product names themselves. In this sweatshirt from Torfsteiner's children's line, which is thankfully now defunct, um, they have the actual runic symbols spelled out uh, across the whole um, sweatshirt, and it says, you know, Torsteiner, know your ABCs, right? So your ABCs are the runic symbols, and it's futars, right? So it's the Nordic um, names of the products. And, you know, again, Nordic Storm, um, Viking brand, you'll see um, legends and heroes and symbols constantly um, displayed. You also get even sometimes the text of, and this is 35 euros, this t-shirt, you'll get the text um, that, that does a little more instructive kind of legend or, or linking legends to, um, to some of the ideology. So this one says, the, right across the side of the abdomen, um, the wind howls like hungry wolves, Wotan, that's a Nordic god, and his wild army fly over the, the forest and the meadows, and this way the hunters hunt all around, the rage riders well knows the way. And the t-shirt is called Rage Rider. So again, a lot of that anger and um, emotive uh, stuff folding into kind of the legends. And this, this iconography also got messed up in the slide, but uh, this brand, Ansgar Akian, whose um, tagline is Patriotic Inc., the catalog cover uh, from this year said, in this time without honor in which old values don't hold true anymore, Ansgar Akian stands, uh, stands for loyal friends, old heroes, dramatic gods, and true ideals. So you have this kind of sense of um, of, of integrity, of honesty, of loyalty, of emotions that are carried through the clothing. So, you know, why were they so powerful? It's one of the questions I asked young people in interviews. Why are they so valued by the far right? On the one hand, they do things like evoke whiteness or Aryanness without using taboo or illegal symbols. So a lot of young people told me this, that um, Aryan is a placeholder for, that Nordic is a placeholder for Aryanness, which is a placeholder for whiteness, right? So it enables you, by talking about Nordic, evoking the Nordic for some of these, it enables you to, to evoke whiteness without actually talking about race. Um, others, Mahmud, which is, uh, you know, uh, you may know from the name of a person also of Turkish origin, who I interviewed, I can talk about that in question and answer, just simply said, look, also the further you come toward the north, the whiter the people are. So he thought that it evoked that because of geography. Um, it also does, because it ties back to some of these um, sacred origin narratives, does things like position Germans, whether, it, whether in reality or, or in fantasy, as, as sort of poised to restore a golden era in which Germanic tribes were the apex of civilization. It valorizes these violent quests and honorable deaths and revered weapons, so there's a lot of ancient weaponry in the t-shirts. Georg says, for example, trying to explain the meaning of a t-shirt that had a Nordic god on it and the phrase, oh, you're looking for a fight, he said, look, Nordic gods were always the most powerful, they were honored, so this, oh, you're looking for a fight is a proclamation. If someone wants to fight with us, he can have it, but he'll lose. And that's why these Nordic gods are applied. If they put an Aphrodite on it, then everybody would say, what kind of crap is that, right? Um, they also identify traits to which one should aspire, as you saw on that catalog cover. So uh, emotive traits and aspirational qualities like heroism, and loyalty, and integrity, and devotion. They identify who belongs and who doesn't. Um, they help identify and at this sort of anticipation of an alternative world or future utopian thinking. So there are lots of things all um, piled up inside the use of those, even though that might not always be rationally explainable that, that might um, that in many ways help ex explain why they're important um, and what they do for young people. So overall, that's just a chapter on Nordic myths, but overall in the book, um, what I argue that the brands do for the far right um, is a series of things. But one is the grant access. Um, so Martin, who self-identified as a right-wing nationalist, said, Look, when I go out, the clothes are actually really important because you won't get into a lot of events at all if you're not dressed as a right-wing person. So he was talking about access to sort of underground events, 
courtyards, if people don't know you, they might think you're a journalist. That was the example we gave. And so, um, you know, having the right look is really important for getting access. But much more often I heard um, almost constantly young people talk about this, this sense of um, people who are like-minded. And so Stefan said, for example, the clothing provides a group togetherness feeling, symbolism. We are one, we wear the same thing. We symbolize Torsteiner, Torsteiner symbolizes writing ideas. Well, Torsteiner was just only an example. It could also have been Lonsdale or something. This is a complicated um, thing to have included. Uh, but Lonsdale is a co-opted brand. So there are brands that are also co-opted that are not deliberately being sold for the market. But Lonsdale got co-opted in the 80s and 90s because when you wear a bomber jacket zipped up, uh, halfway over the, the uh, logo Lonsdale, it shows NSDA, which are the first four initials of the Nazi party, NSDAP. And in fact, probably the first commercialization happened uh, in around 1990 when a brand called Kanzakla was trademarked that sold nothing other than a t-shirt that had that same logo but had the P in it. And they made it through the Trademark Commission for about three weeks before the Trademark Commission realized what they were doing and denied and revoked the trademark. But uh, it never became a full brand. They were just selling that one t-shirt. But it was the idea of creating a new product for a market that probably <laughs> helped them launch it. Finally, they don't just provide access or help you identify other people. Um, but I also heard from a lot of young people about this idea of facilitating a sense of belonging or meaning through the clothing. So Lucas, who was an interesting case because he got his first uh, far-right clothing from his father, who he describes as more far-right than he is. Um, he said, you go into a bar or someplace to party, you see someone with Toshana clothing on, and so you think, okay, maybe I'm not so alone after all, or I'm not the only one who can't exactly identify with mainstream society. Okay. So every project has its skeptics. As you know, mine were fixated in reviews on one thing. Um, as I tried to get funding for this project and then in reviewers' comments over the years and publications, how could clothing radicalize youth? You know, aren't you being alarmist? Aren't you being a little bit, aren't you exaggerating? Or one reviewer simply put it, won't they just grow out of it, right? Isn't this, how is this different from me being a punk in the 1980s who are pursuing the heat of the um, you know, I think this is, um, I, think you're, I think you're being alarmist, basically. So I, I learned from those review comments that I had to spend more time articulating what I came to frame as how style can act as a gateway to extremism. And so I won't spend a lot of time on these, but um, essentially in the book, I argue a series of uh, ways, which I've just sort of summarized for you some of them, but one, establishing legitimacy, sing signaling membership and ideology, um, providing access, celebrating and valorizing violence for a cause, offering a sense of purpose and noble quest, softening racist expression by evoking whiteness without mentioning race. So all of these things are ways that style can act as a kind of a gateway or an entry point to, to extremism. But they also do things like desensitize and socialize consumers and peers and dehumanize victims. And I didn't show you many of those examples, but the book takes, through, takes you through more of them. Um, there's a lot of humor in a lot of the t-shirts in ways that that was the hardest part for me, I will say, of um, the interview was, was I showed them a series of 34 images and there were images that they laughed at a lot because they, they thought they were funny and, um, and they were intended to be funny. Um, of course, I found them not funny, but they were difficult to um, to get through. But they, and that laughter and the humor and the use of humor and the desensitization and dehumanization process, I think, is also really important. They also act as a conduit of resistance to mainstream society in ways that I think are really appealing to young people. So that gaming and the, the coding, the game playing, is really important. So overall, the argument I make is that they can strengthen. I mean, it's hard to make a total causal argument on a qualitative project, but they can strengthen rest, racist and nationalist identification, and they can mobilize extremist action, and we should take them seriously for that potential. Um, so I'm going to close with just a couple of thoughts, just enough to get us started in conversation about whether schools or other bands work. Um, you know, the short answer is no. Uh, they, they, as I found, uh, in Germany mostly, I would say, backfire and further fuel extremism. So 
You'll see things like schools banning the number 88 from display, um, only to have students show up with t-shirts and say, you know, 87 plus 1 or 100 minus 12, right? I mean, it's just a, the, the banning itself has created the kind of game playing culture and appeal that makes it fun to take out vowels or to, um, to um, try to get around authorities and, uh, and make it difficult. And they're also nearly impossible to enforce. So, uh, one of the teachers in the school that doesn't have a ban says, you know, where, he was describing having been on a, a train, a subway train, in Wuhan, with, um, sitting across from someone wearing one of his shirts, and he was admiring the shirt, thinking, I mean, that's a really, you know, it's an attractive looking shirt. And so the longer I looked at it, the more I realized, oh, what is that iconography doing? And then, I, you know, after a while on the train, I realized this was a far right message. And he said, then he continued on, he said, you know, where are the lines drawn now? Where should they be drawn next year? Torstein is a relatively clear story, but there are constantly new brands coming out that are known first in the scene and that have clear impacts, which let's say are not at all apparent at first to outsiders. And young people told me this, this too. So one of the um, students told me about going to Poland to bring back the t-shirts and to get it there um, for less expensive. He came back from a school trip and bought it while he was on a school trip. And his grandmother told him that you can't wear that to school. And he said, you know, he was, he was telling me the story to tell me how far behind adults were in understanding the scene. And he said, my grandmother knew it, right? And it was like such derision. Like, if my grandmother, he said, the brand is dead, we're onto something else, right? Like, if my grandmother already knows what the brand is, it's over, right? There's no, and so, you know, this was reinforced by the students who were basically saying, yes, those brands are out there, but that's not what the real extremists are wearing. We're onto something else, right? So by the time you're, you're able to detect what's happening as adults, um, we're not going to know. You're not going to you're not going to be onto the right brands. So, you know, having a list of, of logos that you can't wear doesn't really um, necessarily make sense. But I will say, you know, I think they're also important anyway, and this I came to see this more clearly actually here in the States after Charlottesville when this discussion got taken up around banning at campuses much more. Um, and here I'd be fascinated to hear, you know, you've been right at the heart of it here at Berkeley. Um, but I think one of the things the bans do is that they assert and defend institutional values and show where the line in the sand gets drawn. So another teacher said, look, school has to be a place of neutrality, and it's important that it be that for everybody. So I came to see the bands as having symbolic importance for everybody else, right? So in other words, they're not effective at, at addressing or treating or preventing or intervening in right-wing extremism. They may even backfire and make right wing extremism more attractive to young people, but they may be, the trade-off is that they may be really important for everybody else to set what the institutional values are, what the norms are, where we draw the line, what we stand for as a community. And so, you know, happy to talk about that more, but I often get asked, you know, um, by reporters now, what, you know, what should we be doing? And the, the, our, the, the, the claim I always make is that the response I always have is, you know, you have to weigh those, those two kind of things. Um, to conclude, I'll just tell you a little bit about what I say in the conclusion about what would better interventions look like, because I am also in a school of education, so I spend time thinking about this. Um, you know, in the book, I spend much more time arguing what the emotional, the, the emotive kind of, the emotional aspects of the clothing messaging is, and so there's a whole chapter on masculinity, there's a chapter on, um, on, uh, on the global symbols and, and different aspects of it um, that come up here. So I talk a little bit about, you know, what, what do interventions look like that come up with alternative ways um, to address the appeal of calls to male strength, physicality, loyalty, integrity, belonging. So there's a pilot project in Germany that takes at-risk youth, um, uh, youth at risk for both uh, foreign fighting or for joining, uh, trying to fight for ISIS, but also um, far-right extremism and pairs them up with firefighters, basically. The idea being that there's a, a kind of heroic impulse that's being, you know, something being a part of something bigger than yourself. Um, there's a partnership, an interesting partnership with martial arts instructors that's trying to kind of identify uh, where pathways to radicalization happen and, and train those martial arts instructors to recognize and intervene. There's a, a video game and beta testing um, here in Silicon Valley that is trying to develop a really high quality game that the premise is, though, based on humanitarian mission and rescue instead of warfare. Right? So could you could you catch some of the same impulses but not have it be about 
enacting violence, but rather rescuing. Mm -hmm. um, so those are some of the kinds of examples, but there's really, this is a very thin area of work uh, in terms of what works. So to conclude my last slide, I'll just say uh, the theoretical arguments I make, again, just to remind you about this um, issue around economic goods, you know, the argument I've been making when I talk in sociology departments is that you know, we as sociologists and other social scientists, this too, for a long time have, have looked at economic goods for their role and contributions to social inequality, and those are important. Um, but that we might also think about reminding ourselves of, of an earlier or a different version of Durkheimian approach to commodities as cultural objects that can carry emotion, that can convey meaning, um, that can constitute identities, and that can, in fact, conform consumers' life choices and behaviors. Um, and in fact, we have good research showing this is true for other kinds of identities, right? That we know that. Um, your identity as a green person, an eco person, is strengthened when you when you buy a hybrid car, when you purchase eco things, when you make cons you know uh, uh, deliberate decisions as a consumer. That religious identities can be strengthened by buying halal or, or kosher. Um, Michelle Lamont has done good work on uh, there's an article with uh, Vera Molnar on uh, uh, African American identity strengthened by supporting African American businesses. So we have these patterns in the research. But nothing like this has ever been talked about for extremist identity, the idea that consumption might also um, strengthen extremist identity. So the argument I make in the book is that economic objects, we have to consider that they might not only be exploitative, but also constitutive. Or another way of saying that is that style is not just a reflection of identity, but might also shape it. That's where I end the book. Um, I'm happy to talk also about what I've done since then with the new brands and looking at across six different countries uh, in the question and answer. And I should leave my slide of many, many thanks up there for a little bit, as well as the photographers and uh, archivists and all my research assistants who helped with this. But happy to take questions. Thank you.
So there are a couple of things. On the brands, there's a range, I'll say, first of all. There's a range of how engaged they are. So Torsteiner, for example, this brand that started the whole thing, was started in 2002 by two guys, one of whom was said to have and known to have associations to the far right scene, the other of whom was said to be just profit oriented. Um, in 2005, the profit oriented guy bought out the other guy. So from 2005 onward, it became really just a, as far as anyone can tell, you know, a profit making initiative that was also marketing itself to a broader range of groups. There are other groups that like Nordic symbols, right? So biker groups and heavy metal groups, I mean, there are groups that use Nordic symbols not in a far right way, and that's important to understand they were trying to market to a wider range of groups, but also knew very clearly what they were doing with the far right. Then in 2008, the brand got bought by a conglomerate based in Dubai. So it's now owned. <laughs> so this is a, you know this is a story that is a much more complicated story about commercialization and how profits, what drives profits and who's producing it and what the market. So so but then there are brands, there are other brands that are funding you know neo-Nazi music concerts and you'll see things on their website that you know rail you know that. Sorry to all of our customers who got shut, you know, who who had to leave the concert when it was shut down by the authoritarian police. You know, so you'll see things like that on their websites, and you know what's happening. Um, and there are brands that are linked to political parties. So, uh, where if you go to the or, or to social movements like the Identitarians, if you go to their website um, in the UK, for example, there's a link to Shop, and Shop will take you to some of the brands' websites, right? So they're linked to the merchandise. So there's a whole spectrum, I guess, is what I'm saying. So I, I am very careful to use, to not call them far-right brands. I call them brands that market to the far-right. I think that that's a, a distinction. Hopefully, no one will ever find the opposite of my book. I was really careful to make that distinction because I think that it captures the whole range. And in a way, for what I'm trying, the, the groups that I'm, the, the, the subcultural scenes that I'm trying to study, it doesn't even matter that much because I'm not interested in the organized groups. Those are important and there are a lot more scholars studying them. Um, I'm interested in groups who I call in and around far right scenes who are at the margins. I want to know how they get drawn in, where do they move from the mainstream into the extreme, how is the extreme reaching out to the mainstream. So those kinds of flows, and I think this is one of the points where that happens. So I think the youth I interviewed also are, you know, only one of them flat out in the interview said, I'm a far right nationalist. We had, I developed a whole categorization with 12 stages to show, you know, 12 different levels of showing closeness to the scenes. All but three had what we call, a research assistant in Germany and I call a significant degree of closeness to the scene. But, you know, they were former far right, they said, right? They were, um, their brother was, their father was, their next door neighbor was, right? So they, they were good informants and I'm, I deliberately chose those youth because I wanted youth who I thought would be good explainers of the phenomenon, but also the kinds of youth who might get drawn into it. And some, and you know, some of them would say things like, "I have that shirt hanging in my closet," but would not themselves say they were far right. Right? They don't see themselves as far right. They just like the brand. So there's, so there's a range here, and I think that that's important to understand too. That I'm, I'm not the person studying the hardcore neo-Nazi of it, of it, but I think this group is also important to understand. The last people you described, yeah. they, that influenced you to see it as a gateway. Exactly. And that's, you know, because I think that this is, the, I'm very interested, because I'm in, you know, in my education role, I'm very interested in knowing where are the points where we might still reach and might still intervene. Yes, I think there are de-radicalization programs that are important and intervention programs, but when you're talking about prevention or early intervention, I think these are the youth where they're, they're, they could go, they, and they, they flow in and out, right? So sometimes you'd hear in an interview like they'd been in a party where people got arrested because someone gave the Hitler salute. You know, there were clues in the interviews to the kinds of scenes that they were a part of, but then they also talked about having friends who were diverse or, you know, friends who were immigrants or, you know, so they, there's lots of contradictions in the way they talk, and I think they were, I, I'm interested in that group of youth because I see them as young people who could go this way or that way, or might step into this, and then some of them get radicalized further. Um, and the way that this gateway can socialize them, what messaging can happen. Will some of them grow out of it? Of course. You know, I think even most of them will grow out of it, but um, not all of them, and even those who don't, I still think are important to understand for how they support um, and provide support even quietly to more violent movements. 
Yeah, I have a question about gender. I saw yeah. like girly t-shirts. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Girls and boys. And a question about the dynamics in the school that you were able to observe. Are those kids dressing like that? Are, are those the, the cool kids, the popular yeah. kids, or what? Are, or are they the marginalized ones? Yeah. Yeah. Um, gender is a great question. So uh, the clothing is, all of them have uh, lines for women, but there are many fewer products for women. Um, I shouldn't say all of them. Of the new brands I'm studying now, there are a couple that are only men's clothing, but there are many, many fewer women's products, and they are much less violent in their iconography, So you um, and usually less ideological also. So the women tend to be um, more sexualized. So for example, there's a t-shirt that I talk about in the book that is um, uses the exact same phrase in both the men's and the ver women's version of the shirt, which translates as some, it's sort of the kind of thing you would maybe see on a dating site, but also could be a provocation to the police. It's like uh, ready for contact, ha happy to be in contact and ready for adventure. That's the phrase. But in the men's shirt, it's it's exact same colors and it has uh, red iconography, red red spattered blood, right? So you, that is a violent message, right? And the women's shirt, same exact colors, but it's red puckered lips, right? So it's a sexualized uh, message. So same message, same brand, you know, but the iconography tells you what contact and adventure means. So, um, and then, you know, in, in the other clothing, you, you'll see some of the brands that have a kind of Still obsession with women's bodies and fitness, just as I don't talk about that here, the hypermasculinity and the, the fitness and the physical body, but I did show some of those images a bit in the previous talk this week. Um, and you'll see some like in serving roles, like serving drinks, um, you know, images of that kind of stuff. But it's much, much less. And that women are do play a more active role in the movement. I also have an edited volume that came out this year. <laughs> um, and, and so I know that women are playing a more active role across the spectrum in the far right, but uh, this stuff is still very heavily marketed to the men. Um, on the, quickly on the question of the coolness, nothing that I saw, but vocational schools are a little bit different. It's, if I was in, a, in a, one of the middle schools, Hauptschule, Realschule, something like that, the middle level, maybe even in the gymnasium, I would see that in vocational schools, they're spending three, four days a week on their work site, and then they're coming back um, for just a day or two a week at the school. So I think school culture issues are a little bit different in the vocational schools in terms of, you know, dynamics about coolness or groups or cliques because they're not quite, um, I wasn't able to see it anyway. And it wasn't ethnography, so I, it was not an ethnography, so I wasn't hanging around as long as I would have liked to. <clears throat> Same uh, phenomenon uh, also occurring on the, the left. Uh, yeah, the same thing in Germany, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the linked or does the, yeah, does the right have better yeah. Symbols, and it always seems like you know, I understand this is you know, the, the right, but you know, uh, polarization of uh, due to you know, neoliberalism is supposed to cause extremes in both directions, but it seems it's asymmetric toward the right. Uh, what's your impression? I haven't seen a single brand come out that is that is explicitly selling clothing with left leaning or leftist messages. <coughs> there are clothing. There are isolated <coughs> items that are things like refugees welcome here, um, or anti-fascist you know, iconography, anti-fascist shirts. But those very quickly show up in the far right brands. Um, so uh, one, the refugees welcome, you know, the exact same iconography, a t-shirt showed up in one of the brands that says, Islam must go home, but using the same exact, you know, uh, um, the, the, um, there was a anti-racist concert um, called Dancing in the Air, and there was this is a t-shirt in one of the 34 images. I never knew what the reference was, but it was a, an, a, a stick figure being hung um, from a gallows, and it was the image that I found the hardest to look at. It was a, um, I just found it very offensive, the actual image, and this was the one that they laughed at the most, because it said dancing in the air, and they said, oh, that's really funny because it's twitching, so, you know, it's dancing in the air. But one of them said, oh, that's a play on this concert that was held in 2012. So I looked it up, sure enough, there was a concert called Dancing in the Air. So they're saying, you know, the Dancing in the Air concert in Rostock was an anti-racist concert, and then the far right comes out with a shirt that says, this is what Dancing in the Air is, you know, to us. So, so it was a, it's a constant kind of taking, you'll see in the US now, t-shirts that say, um, 
get a man on a snowflake, snowflake symbol, um, that uses the tagline that stirs into their safe space one shirt at a time. Right? You'll see kind of um, messages that try to take the language from the left, imagery from the left. Uh, I saw the Martin Che Guevara t-shirts because they say they're freedom fighters, Palestinian scarf for the same reason, Gandhi quotes. So there's, you know, all these kinds of um, what I call traveling images, right, where they empty out the meaning and then reinfuse it with a new meaning, uh, which I talk about in the chapter on Google symbols. So it's, but I haven't seen, but some of you may know, uh, you know, who, who are more engaged in leftist scenes may be aware of brands that I'm not, but I haven't seen any of it. Yes, I wanted to comment also on this gender aspect yeah. because you also know um, in your answer you talked about the, like, that female Nazis become more common. Yeah. And I just wanted to add that um, I would say it's not a new phenomenon, but yes. also in the last decades there were many women active in like the extremist um, terror groups, also in the 80s, also involved in um, killing people and committing bomb with bomb plastics. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted um, to comment on the slide um, where you propose like alternative ways to deal with mm -hmm. that because there you, um, I, I understood it as you were focusing on masculinity. Mm -hmm. And I would say that it's not enough, you know, and I think it's in a way dangerous to focus too much on masculinity because you, uh, you will forget the women um, or the young women especially that are radicalizing or somehow getting um, part of the right wing as we've seen and um, I mean um, I don't know if everybody knows about the German context so where there was a huge terrorist network um, that was discovered only a couple of years ago and um, there was a trial against um, five of its members and like one of the main perpetrators was a woman and she when she was in youth club yeah. she was asked like what do you want to become when you are an adult and you were talking about men some, one of them wanted to become a hairdresser and another one in the garden, and she said, first we have to get rid of the power in us. And yeah. like, that is what she did, and there was no like pedagogical concept to deal with it, though she was in the youth club. So that's why I would just yes. like, really um, put weight into this. It's not only about masculinity, it's also a question of white femininity. Yes. Um, yeah, absolutely fair point. I think we really have to understand the role of white women here in this country, too. and. Uh, and, and young women in Germany and older women as well. And I think we're seeing that with also in the Pegida, you know, the, the citizen left marches in the movements where you see way more women visible than you ever have before, but also in the violent, um, in the violent, you know, Nazi movements in the extremist range. So completely fair point. I appreciate it. Yeah, I want um, a lot of what I want to um, ask you about has been touched on by a few different people and by you, but um, what I kind of found missing was the whole other side, which would be, why are they accentuating their whiteness? Mm -hmm. So so one question would be, like, to what extent has maybe an influx of, of non-whites, mm -hmm. refugees, maybe more educated um, mm -hmm. people that kind of makes um, a lot of white people, which we see here in this country, to kind of wonder, well, when do I get mine? Mm -hmm. Like, I even have cousins who say, well, I went to the unemployment office, and all these other people were getting, you know, I wasn't black, I wasn't Latino, I wasn't this, I wasn't that, so I didn't get something. So I was wondering to what extent that this, this might be part of the, um, mm -hmm. the motivation or the, mm -hmm. the, the rationale. Yeah, I think, I mean, certainly you hear talk of the, and as we do here too, the demographic change being a driver, but um, I'm just trying to think how often it came up. I mean, in the interviews, they they do say uh, some public things. Uh, and th most of this came up from actually my first book that was less focused on their clothing but more focused on their identity. Um, uh, but it was more um, fear, you know, so I, I'll never forget one of them after having a whole discussion about all the things he didn't like about foreigners, you know, I, at the end of it I said, how many foreigners have you met? You know, and he said, you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you know, we were talking in German, right? In German and I have German roots and I had it, you know, like it was, it was, um, you know, so it was, it, there's, there's a lot of contradictions in the way their lives work, and that's changing, of course. I mean, there is a, there is much more diversity in their lives and in their schools than there was when I first did that first book's research almost 20 years ago. But, um, but I would say if I had to characterize, 
in one sentence the the rationales, it would be that it was um, uh, contradictory, chaotic, and um, not logical, right? They they their 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 logic for the ways in which they felt wasn't really tied to factual information. It was emotionally driven, based on their perception of things that were changing, but they weren't rooting what they were saying in arguments about change or arguments about demography. It was about the smells on the streets or I don't like the street behind me and that name, right? Um, in a different language. And and you know, one of the things I think that I have critiqued the Germans for before, but I have so much respect for the German teachers and they have been my allies all along these 20 years. But the teachers uh, and the schools have been for a long time very focused on a strategy called argumentation, which is how to provide teachers with accurate facts um, to counter what's being said in the classroom immediately. And um, I think that's important, and you know, they need to know what to say if someone says Hitler's not so bad, or Hitler wasn't so bad, or refugees are fleecing the social welfare system. Like This is how you can immediately respond, and there's a lot of good training to do that. But I think um, it's, uh, as one teacher used, you know, said to me, that this is a, it's a, it's cosmetology, cosmetology instead of medicine, right? That's the way she described it. We're just, we're just papering over, you know, we're just trying to clean it up, but we're not actually, you know, intervening. Um, and it, it, out of frustration, like feeling like this is, we don't have any tools to really understand how to do it. So on the other side of that, would, would you say that, that these, that, that it's not necessarily that they're marginalized against foreigners, but maybe class-wise, because these are all working class, so they don't fit into the mainstream white educated that have power. I mean, I would say that one of the things I had to add in both my first book's interviews and in this interview was a code for the interviews called Hard Lives, which just describes, which because they're just, they, I was stunned at the casualness with which they talked about, and this isn't to say that everyone who has a hard life presents that, but, you know, one of them said, talking about his friend, his really good friend who's a really hardcore neo-Nazi, and he said, well, he's had a harder time than I have, he's been in prison way more times than me, right? And so, then he's like, I only went once, I learned from that, right? And, uh, you know, those kinds of things, drug overdoses, you know, absent parents, having to raise their younger siblings when they turned 18, um, you know, returnees, not getting into programs, not, you know, so the, so again, those aren't excuses, but they, um, they definitely, these are definitely young people who have traveled difficult paths and, um, and uh, haven't been exposed to a lot. And, and the ones who talked about, and again, in my first book, the number one thing that drew them away from the far right was extended, deep, long interaction with someone who's different from them. Their brother married someone from Vietnam, their teacher was Turkish, they sat next to somebody in class who was from Bosnia, right? And over the course of years of engagement, they had had their assumptions challenged in ways that took them away, and they realized that their ideas were wrong. Um, but, you know, that is a hard thing to scale up. Um, so, uh, so that's, you know, um, those are those are dilemmas that I think about every day. Uh, thinking about interventions. Spencer, you've been waiting so patiently. I had two questions. Well, the answer to your other question about brands and the left is yes. brands has the left as a critique of commodification exactly. right. and yeah, the far right likes Doesn't national happen. capital and right. so you know, right. people so on the left would like remove same. brand logos and right. stuff in the past. Right, right, right. Of course. I was curious about two of the concepts you used. The first is um, whiteness. You use yeah. whiteness as the same <laughs> as Aryan and Yorkiness, and yeah. that's not my experience in Germany yeah. um, or Europe, that they tend to have national racial identities mm -hmm. and that Aryanness can even be counterposed, especially to Slavicness. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. you can't take American concepts of white mm -hmm. and transpose it there. That yeah. it's a very different thing. I mean, they do have a concept of pan-European whiteness, but it's different than mm -hmm. they're talking about, mm -hmm. especially especially if you say Aryan. Um, the second is white time about youth culture and not counterculture. Because mm -hmm. when I watch this, I'm like, well, that's skinhead stuff and that's soccer stuff, mm -hmm. and this is maybe these people aren't countercultural at all. Like in New York, the far right skinhead scene, which would basically be the people wearing these brands and stuff, they're there. 20s and 30s, and the older ones are like in their early 50s. Yeah. Um, and so it's not, the countercultures are multi generational. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just curious about how some of this thing you talk about, I'm like, well, that's true of yeah. any counterculture, they're like running a belonging. Yeah, I that's think. a great question. Do that anybody. So, what's the relationship yeah, there? Really good questions. So, um, on the second point, I should, I should give more thought to that. I think that. Uh, 
I'm, because I am interested in schools and school-based interventions, I've been thinking about youth for a long time, but using youth in a, in a wide, like all the way up to at least through the 20s, right? Um, so a long tail. And then that's why these two 34 and 39 year olds were really, I keep them in there. You, I could have removed them. We did remove them from the sample from one article because the reviewer was like, these aren't youth, right? So I just took them out and then the sample was too, too small. It was 49 and the average age went down. Um, but, you know, they talked so much about their youth also and a lot of what they were really informative about how they became engaged. One of them said, um, for example, that he didn't know anybody who wasn't far right when he was growing up, right? Not a single person. And so, you know, just everybody at school, everybody he knew, all of his older siblings and cousins and friends in the neighborhood. And so they're, you know, they're just, of course, there are whole neighborhoods in Germany. It's a different kind of a thing than you have here. Um, so I don't have a great answer to that, but I want to think about that more. Um, I would say, you know, I'm, I'm, my predominant interest is in youth, but is this is this youth based or is it counterculture based? Um, I think you could, I mean, you could have found many people yeah. that age too. Yeah, yeah, time. probably. I think it's harder to get access. Well, anyway, it's also a question of how the sample worked out. Like who said yes, right? And who stood up? Um, and the first question, yes, I think about this a lot, uh, and um, and I I may not I may not be one hundred percent right on that. I, I think that their conceptions are nationalist in terms of race, but I do think that there's something to the broader claim about how Nordic symbols get used in a kind of pan-Aryan, pan-white kind of way of thinking that is different than just nationalist German. Because these, you know, they're selling these across multiple countries and they're selling them across right. across Eastern Europe, across. So I agree with you that that is the accurate way to think about it, but I'm not sure that's the logic that's in all of their heads. But, it, but I'd love to talk to you about that more. I, and that gets back I'm, to I'm not sure either. Yeah. I'm like, we have Slavs, Slavs yeah, yeah. become white there too. This like, gets back to this question about how logical are they in their thinking, right? And I think that um, the way they talked to me about it, that's the way the analysis panned out, but it could be that, um, could, of course it could be that I overlooked something, but I also think that um, that they aren't, they're not t as tied to historical ways of reasoning as, as, as we might think. Although, of course, the the shirts themselves are very rooted in history, and a lot of the shirts are used, you know, refer to things. I mean, I had to go to a lot of history books to decode. Um, there's an incredible depth to a lot of the references, which um, from World War II that that are hard to detect. So they're not these are not stupid, you know, stupid codes. These are there's a lot of smart iconography. I think that's one of the other things I'm underestimating um, both women and the far right in general for for how a lot of the intellectual things. are. Um, yeah, a couple of things. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, it's really stimulating on a lot of levels. So my background is in community psychiatry. Um, so you just alluded to something a couple of minutes ago when you quoted one of the teachers about cosmetology versus yeah. getting deep. And as a public health person, uh, I'm always interested in primary prevention. So the issue here, which you again alluded to, is facts versus emotions. Yeah. And we have a great retired professor here at this university named George Lakoff, mm -hmm. who has written profoundly on this subject. And um, to me, what's of interest is how do these kids start out emotionally? Yeah. And there's a lot of literature here about uh, people coming into young adulthood and adulthood migrating to the right because they're damaged goods to begin with, quote unquote. Um, you could say we're all damaged goods under capitalism, of course, but some are more damaged than others. And, and in Germany, it's my understanding that a lot of the right-wing uh, stuff happened in Eastern Germany first, when they were coming out of communism, so-called. Um, and, and I wonder if that's still true, whether it's migrated west into Western Germany as much. Uh, and the final point is, I would encourage people to rent or stream a movie here called The Brainwashing of My Dad, mm -hmm. uh, which is here in the United States. And the filmmaker documents how her father, who had been a white liberal for years, 
got brainwashed initially listening to Rush Limbaugh and of course Fox News. And she really does a brilliant dissection of how this operates. And I think that it's operating over there too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, great questions. I, the argument that I make in the book is that there are two primary impulses that underpin the whole thing emotionally. One is the desire to be to belong or to be a part of something bigger. Um, that's all the heroic action, the, uh, the contribute to have meaning, right? To, to yeah. enact a sense of meaning, to look for something bigger than yourself. And the other is the desire to resist, and that's where all the anger. Um, and um, you know the exclusion, the idea of exclusion from your society, on your language, like your society, and uh, to not fitting into the mainstream, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of language. Um, a lot of the product names use the language of rebellion. Um, uh, they they use words like rebellion, resistance. You have um, one of them had a tagline. Its tagline was "Widerstand ist Anziehen." which means it's a play on words that means resistance is attractive, but also resistance is wearable, right? Um, so it's a, it's a, it has a double meaning. Which That's is pretty capitalist. Really smart, right? Um, and so, you know, those two impulses, I think, are captured in a lot of the messages that come across the clothing, and, um, and I think explains a lot of the appeal. And, and you know, one of the arguments I try to make is that, but then the ideal, it's not that the ideology doesn't matter, but those emotional impulses might draw people in, and that's the gateway. And then the ideology is there, right? The ideology comes through when also in the dehumanizing and the desensitizing, the socializing toward messages, sometimes the image on the, the iconography itself has no ideology, but the text on the website. So you'll have a shirt that just has an anchor on it. But then the text on the website says, are you as sick of the migration craziness as we are? Well, then throw down the anchor. Raise the borders, batten down the hatches. Right? And, but there's nothing. You're just walking around with a nice, that looks like you'd be on Martha's Vineyard. It's like a blue washed, you know, like acid washed shirt with an anchor. And, um, you know, sold by, by uh, you know, sold by a, far, a, 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 a company known to market to the far right. And so, um, you know, so I think those two those two emotional impulses really have to be understood as understood for the ways in which they layer into and, and draw people into the ideology, which is the gateway or access points or whatever. Uh, and the second question was also really interesting. Oh, East, yeah, I, I always get a question about East and West. Um, so, you know, the 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 thing about the data uh, in Germany on the East and the West is that um, the data shows that attitudes, far right attitudes are higher in the east, but violence is higher in the west. And so that has historically been the data. I haven't checked it in the last year or two, but I think it's so it's important to understand it as a as a phenomenon across the country and that it can't be reduced to a problem of the east. Um, I will say that the east is targeted more heavily for the marketing and most of the stores um, from this one brand to China are in the former eastern states. And uh, one of the reasons why Berlin was particularly interesting to me as a site was because the scaffold builders, there's only a few places to train to be a scaffold builder in Germany, and so you have to come for a residential stay if you're not local. So they come for six week stays from, um, uh, into, to the Berlin location they come from across the east. So I was able to interview young people from Leipzig and Dresden and other places um, uh, in the east by, by interviewing scaffold builders. Um, and then, so that gave me a little bit more of the sense of what's happening. But again, these are small numbers. It's still a really qualitative sample to be talking about 51 youth. And so um, I, I can't risk anything about East or West definitive from this group. Right? Plus, they're all born, of course. These are all, I mean, except for the 34 and 39 year old, these are all they've grown up for showing you to find Germany. But, but still very much marked by the differences, their parents and their parents' generation. Right. Well, an interesting thought that occurs, given what you're just saying, is that at the end of World War II, so Germany is divided, right? And yeah. so one could argue, and we know that a lot of Nazis remained in Western Germany. <laughs> How much were they purged in Eastern Germany? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, and then the yeah. multi-generation, you know, the transmission yeah, yeah, yeah. through generation. Right, right. Well, 
and it's, and I'll say, I, that came up much more in my first book when I was doing interviews in 1999, 2000, 2001, so young people were 10, 11, 12, you know, at the time of the, of the unification, and so they were very clear, that, and teachers were still being paid differently in the same school, right, I mean, there were really, there were strong differences also from the, from the teachers, and teachers had to go through two years of what was called re-socialization training to be able to teach history or civics, which is what I was studying, the Sozianka and the civics classes. So uh, that was a very, very common theme then. Um, it came up much, much less this time, but, uh, but I think that if I were doing a bigger project and were tracing something statistically, I'd have more to say. The, um, there's a, a mid there's, there are studies, there's uh, statistical studies that come out every year that, that trace some of this as well, which I talk about in the book a bit. But, um, but it wasn't a theme that was salient in the interviews as much as one might think. That doesn't mean it didn't have an influence, it just wasn't right in the front. Let me call for a poll. So okay. there's one minute left, so you can uh, sign some books. Sure. <laughs> okay. So please join me in thanking you. Thank you.